Hello, I'm Anissa. Hello, I'm Liz Hodgkin. I gather you're going to tell us about your mother, Dorothy Hodgkins. Can you tell us a bit about her? Yes, uh, my mother was a scientist. Uh, she worked on X-ray crystallography, which is finding the three-dimensional structure of, of, crystal, of crystals, molecules. And she worked on the structure of penicillin, vitamin B12. So she won the Nobel Prize for finding the structure of these. And then she also worked on insulin. Where and when was Dorothy born? She was born in Cairo in 1910. And why she was born in Cairo was because her parents were in the education department in Egypt and then later in Sudan. So she came back to England, she was sent back to England as a baby. And at that time, the parents went off working and they left their children with the grandparents. She was brought up by her grandparents and, with, and her parents remained during the First World War in Sudan. Uh, she was one of the eldest of four children. So you can see that the parents for, were time for a boy. They didn't get a boy, they just got these four girls. When did your mum become interested in science? She became interested in science, I think, quite early. Her mother gave her a book and that fascinated her. And she went, she came from Norfolk, small country town called Beckles, and her father sent her to the local secondary school, which was not very strong secondary school. They'd only sent two people before to university, and most of the people who went to it became who teachers of primary schools. Mm -hmm. And so here's a photograph of her in her science class at secondary school, and you can see that it's a load of boys, and there's just two girls at the very back of the form. But she was interested in science and had a very good science teacher. Um, was your mother the best in her class for science? No, actually, there was another girl called Nora Pusey who got higher marks than she did in science. But her parents were small farmers who had always planned for her to do domestic science after she finished school and to go and teach domestic science in a school. So that's what she did. Whilst my grandfather wanted his daughter to be brought up as a boy and go to university. So that just shows how important it is of what your expectations are. Nora Pusey became a domestic science teacher and actually she died of t t tuberculosis uh, in her 20s. My mother went on to be a famous scientist. How difficult was it for your mother to get into university? Well, uh, it was quite difficult in a way because she wanted to go to Oxford and Oxford asked for a lot of things. It asked for a second science, which she hadn't done at school, and it asked for Latin, which she hadn't done at school. So she had to learn Latin in six months and do the second science. But then uh, someone said, well, she'll get in OK, because they'll practically pay a woman to do science at Oxford. And actually, in her year, there were only four women scientists. What college did Dorothy go, and did she have to get pay to go there? She went to Somerville College, which is a very serious college, and it believed that people, the women especially, had to really work hard and be an example and to show that women merited higher education. Because remember, it was very early. Most women didn't get degrees. A lot of women weren't even allowed to go to university. And at that time, in my time when I was at university, I didn't have to pay. It was in the 1960s. But in her time, people had to pay. But she had an aunt who gave £200 a year for her all the time she was in university. What type of science did your mother specialise in? She was doing chemistry. And so she started to work at chemistry and became very interested. And there were some excellent lectures. Most of the lectures just put out the old stuff, but there were some wonderful lectures, and she really enjoyed it. 
and then she specialised in this new topic, which was called crystallography, which meant that you looked through crystals, you put X -ray, um, the X-rays through crystals, and that could give you how a molecule was built up three-dimensionally. Was there any particular difficulties due to the fact she was a woman at university, there may have been some? If you were a woman, there were some disadvantages. For instance, some of the main Oxford societies didn't allow women in. For instance, the Alembic Club, which was a science society. And once she insisted on going there because it was a lecture she wanted to see, and they apparently carried her and threw her outside bodily. But um, on the whole, she was okay just because she loved her work. She really enjoyed what she was studying and what she was doing. So the fact that there might have been difficulties for being a woman didn't bother her so much. Who was your mother's lecturers at university? Well, there were plenty who later got the Nobel Prize, like Robin, uh, Robert Robinson, like Cyril Hinshelwood, who later became heads of the Royal Society. And although they weren't at Oxford, she went to, there was William Zagg and Lawrence Zagg, his son, who had really founded X-ray crystallography. And they came uh, to Oxford and she attended their lectures and was really, was really excited by it. Did she have an education outside of England? Yes, she did want to learn German, which was very important for her science. And so she went to Germany for two or three months, staying with some scientists called the uh, scientists called Goldschmidt, and uh, she tried to learn German and she worked with him. But it was 1931, two or three. It was 31, I think. It was uh, just the beginning of the rise of Nazism. <coughs> I don't know how much she was aware. She did talk a bit about. Hitler, people weren't so worried at that time, but what happened afterwards was terrible because the Goldschmidts were Jews and so they had to flee uh, Germany. They fled in a couple of years later to Paris and then the wife, old Mrs. Goldschmidt, went back to Prague and she committed suicide just being taken to a camp. So there was a tragedy in the family she stayed with in Germany. What degree did your mum get and what happened after that? She did get a first in chemistry and then after her degree she did a fourth year and then she went to Cambridge for a couple of years where she learnt with a very good scientist and a very charismatic person called J.D. Bernal. And now we're in the middle of the 30s and as you know, um, it's moving to the Second World War. And so there was a big movement of scientists who were opposing Hitler and opposing Nazism. And she was part of that movement of scientists in Cambridge in the 1930s. Of course, she was even stronger in that movement because, as I said late, earlier, that four of her uncles, all four of her uncles, had died in the First World War. So she was always very interested in peace. Did your mother stay in Cambridge? No, she was very happy in Cambridge. She would have liked to have stayed in Cambridge because she loved the work. It was exciting and lively with J.D. Bernal and his group. But in Oxford, they wanted her back, they offered her a fellowship. There were so few women scientists, so Somerville College wanted her to come back as a tutor. So somewhat, and people said, you know, jobs aren't so easy to get. If you're offered a job, especially if you're a woman, if you're offered a job, don't turn it down. So somewhat reluctantly, she came back to Oxford about 1935, and the whole of the rest of her life she actually spent in Oxford. How did your mother begin to work on penicillin? Well, she was working on X-ray crystallography, that's to say finding the structure of the molecules, the three-dimensional structure. 
Now, penicillin, in the 1930s, they began to find, discover the um, antibiotics like the sulfonamides, and one of the naturally occurring antibiotics was penicillin. And so that people like Flory and Chain were working on penicillin, and Norman Heatley was already trying to make penicillin. In fact, they had this very exciting episode that my mother used to tell me often when they started to try penicillin on, I think it was a policeman whose life had been despaired of, and they gave it to him. He was dying, and he started to get better. But penicillin goes through the body very rapidly, and they couldn't keep making it fast enough actually to save his life, but they could see it saved other lives. And one day my mother was walking in the street in Oxford and Aunt Jane came to, uh, was walking in the other direction and he said, I think soon we're going to have crystals of penicillin that you'll be able to start working on. Can you explain the importance of X-ray crystallography? It's used to find the three-dimensional structure. So if you're doing inorganic or organic chemistry, you can find the, um, uh, the chemical, uh, what should I say, what should I say, sorry, I'll have to start again. Well, that's right, we know it edit. Um, you can find the molecular, um, you can find the actual, you can find the chemical formula. Yes, I so The molecular sorry. formula. Okay, yeah. so I'll start that sentence again. Is that okay? If you're doing um, chemistry, you can find the molecular formula, the formula of a molecule, but by X-ray crystallography, you find the three-dimensional structure and how it fits in together. And that's very important. For instance, you could, the same chemical formula may be that of diamond, which is the hardest thing, and graphite, which is a very soft thing, but um, they're completely different, and unless you know the three-dimensional structure, you can't see why they're different. Could you tell us more about her work on penicillin? So she started working on penicillin at the beginning of the Second World War. And because of the importance of penicillin, especially in curing people with wounds and gangrene, there was an enormous pressure and motivation to get work done on penicillin. There were people, in the, especially in the United States and, uh, and UK, who were working very hard in the structure of penicillin, the analysis of penicillin, the fabrication of penicillin. And she was one of these, uh, but working in her own field of crystallography. How did her work fit in with the work of Florine Chain? She was working in a different, I mean, she was working on the three-dimensional structure, she was working on how it was made up, and usually the finding the structure by X-ray crystallography can help you to synthesize the molecule, whether it's, um, and so use it for medicine, whether it's penicillin or what she was working on later, vitamin B12. But often, Finding the structure just helps you to, uh, to understand it, whilst actually the best way to get the drug for use may be still using it by, um, from its natural sources. I thought that Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. How does that fit in? Well, Alexander Fleming was the first person to spot that this mould on, uh, on a plate of, I think it was of jam or something like that, was killing the bacteria, but he didn't go on with it. It needed Flory later and Chain working on it to, see, to, to really isolate penicillin and, and see the value of it. Um, what happened as a result of her successful work on penicillin? Well, one of the things she began to be one better known, at least in the scientific world, and to get various honours. For instance, she tells a story of how she and 
her colleague J.D. Bernal from Cambridge were sitting on the steps of the Royal Society, which is a kind of Academy of Sciences in England, and Bernal said, that work on penicillin, um, you might get the Nobel Prize for that. And she said, I'd rather be elected to the Royal Society. And he said, ah, that would be more difficult. <laughs> because the Royal Society was closed and didn't let many women in. In the end, in 1947, she was elected as the fourth or fifth woman to be elected to the Royal Society. What did she work on after that? She worked on, vitamin, she worked on several things, but her next major work she worked on was vitamin B12. And now vitamin B12 is uh, the vitamin that is used against pernicious anemia. And you know anemia, it means you don't have enough iron in your body. It comes uh, and already people were using liver as a kind, uh, 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 against pernicious anemia. But uh, like penicillin, although the medicine was being used, it wasn't understood how it worked, and so the X-ray crystallography and getting out the structure of vitamin B12 was helpful in understanding how it's worked, and now it's absolutely widely used. When she was over 70, a nurse came, a carer came to look after her, and she said, I always give my old ladies out over 70 a pill of vitamin B12 a day and my mother gave a secret smile. <laughs> In her lab she taught students, were any of them notable? Uh, one of her students was a woman called Margaret Roberts who, who specialised in chemistry and then later went on to do a fourth year actually doing crystallography. But my mother said she was really not so interested in crystallography she was more interested in politics. And later, after she'd done her fourth year, she did a law degree. She married someone called Thatcher, and she became the first woman Prime Minister of England as Margaret Thatcher. Did your mother have any later contact with Margaret in her life? Yes. Um, well, she met her from time to time, but there was one particular time in the 1980s when the Cold War was still happening and my mother went to Moscow and talked to the Soviet scientists who were doing the same work. And the Soviet scientists said, please, Margaret Thatcher used to be your student, but they don't, she doesn't really regard us as human. Couldn't you <laughs> possibly go and talk to her and persuade her that we are human and that actually most of us want peace? So she waited until Margaret Thatcher won the next election and then she went with the principal of Somerville College at that time called Daphne Park and uh, Margaret Thatcher invited them both to lunch at Chequers and they went down and they tried to persuade her that Russians were human. And later Gorbachev came and things got better. I don't know whether her persuasion was any use or not. At the beginning you told us that your mother received the Nobel Prize. When did she get it? She received it in 1964 for her work on penicillin and vitamin B12. Actually, the work on vitamin B12 had been finished in, had been done in 1955. But the Nobel Prize is often given many years afterwards. So as children, we sort of knew that she was up for the Nobel Prize. So every year when the Nobel Prize was being announced about October and November, we were listening to the radio, listening to the radio. By 1964, we had given up my, she had three children. My elder brother was in Algeria teaching. I was in Zambia teaching in a secondary school and my younger brother was going round the world in his gap year and he was in India. And so we were none of us at home. And she was with my father in Ghana because he was lecturing at the University of Ghana. So not even she was at home when she got the Nobel Prize. 
What did your mother do after she got the Nobel Prize? She worked mostly on insulin. She had taken her first photographs to when you're doing X-ray crystallography, you put the X-ray through the crystal and you take photographs of what uh, of the of what you see and you get these little dots of light and she took her first photograph of insulin in 1934 but insulin was an extremely complex molecule so in a way all her work was leading up to understanding insulin penicillin is relatively simple uh, vitamin B12 is more complicated, insulin was terribly complex and so it took her many years to find out the structure of insulin. Did your mother do any of this on her own? No, uh, all the work was done as part of a team and my mother was very good at getting a lot of people around her who were very good scientists. She was always welcoming and her lab was particularly international with people from all over the world, Russians, Chinese, Indians, Italians, New Zealanders, and would come and spend a few years working with her. And so definitely but it was a very friendly lab. Everyone commented that people were on first name terms, that they worked well together, that they got on well together. One person described how informal the lab was. He said he walked into the lab and he found two of the people with a rolled up chart and the other with a rolled up ball playing cricket in the corridor, and he said, this lab will never discover anything. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us a bit more about other famous scientists within the field? Yes, um, of course. She was doing the X-ray crystallography of protein structures, and before vitamin B12, there were others working in the same field. Crick and Watson got out the structure of DNA using the double helix, which was very, very important. Of course, before that, there would be the American scientist Linus Pauling, who had also got the Nobel Prize and was a very close friend of my mother's. Um, another very close friend of my mother's was a scientist also from Cambridge called Max Perutz, mm -hmm. who worked out the structure of haemoglobin. And all of these got Nobel Prizes um, in the late 50s. In the Nobel Prize, which came to Crick and Watson and Morris Wilkins, there was one woman who has become far more famous than my mother. And it's interesting. My mother got the Nobel Prize, but this woman didn't get the Nobel Prize. Part mostly because she died, but also probably she wouldn't have got it, and people say it's because she was a woman. They gave it to the other three, they don't usually give it to four, but she had taken the photograph of the X ray um, of the of the crystal, which helped Crick and Watson to get the Nobel Prize. But they took the photograph, understood it, worked out the structure of DNA, and they didn't give her due recognition for what she'd done. She's Rosalind Franklin, and far more books and articles are written about her than probably those who have achieved and got things out. How did she manage her uh, career and like to take care of her family? It's actually extremely difficult. And my father used to say often, what your mother needs is a wife. <laughs> um, and I didn't realise how she managed until I read this life of her, because that she, she describes how she would come back from the lab at 4.30 and put us to bed 
and sing a song and then bicycle back to the lab at seven o'clock to go back to, to work. Of course, it's the 1940s and 50s and they, they did, until we were about eight or nine, have nannies to look after us and so that gave her uh, the time. And then my, uh, her sister uh, came to live with us with her five children. She got divorced so that actually there were eight children in the house and that carried away some of the burden of looking after a number of children. Did you accompany your mother when she went to get the Nobel Prize? Yes, I did go. I was teaching in Zambia, so I came back. My brother came back from India. And also, as I said, we were at that time living with our cousins in Oxford. And so all of the cousins came, about five children. She got the Nobel Prize in the same year as Martha Luther King. Actually, Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King brought even more of his family with him. He needed a minibus to take them round. But she brought quite a lot of the family. And you have this great presentation, and then you have a great ball in the palace in Stockholm. And so she led off dancing. Um, and as we, the ball went on, a student walked up to her and handed her an envelope. And that was the envelope with the cheque for £18,000 for the Nobel Prize, which she had dropped on the floor of the ballroom. <laughs> what happened to your mother in her later years? Well, she went on getting honours. And sometimes you might get the honours because you're a woman. For instance, she became Chancellor of Bristol University. And tra a Chancellor's a very distinguished post and normally was only, uh, for women, was, uh, and was only members of the royal family. But she became Chancellor, which means that you're the person who give away degrees. And I remember her last speech for, as Chancellor of Bristol University, when she was talking to the students, and she said, and I hope that some of you, when she was talking about working hard and perhaps becoming famous, and she said, I hope that some of you will live modestly and do serious things. So she went on working then, and she went on working until she was nearly, she was in her 80s. In fact, she went to her last scientific conference in 1983, in 1993, when she was already 83. Um, and I lived with her for the last years, hoping to look after her. But she went on working till the end. She died in 1994, um, and at that time she was 84. My father had already died in 1981, many years before. And people commented that then she got thinner and said, why are you getting so thin? And she said, it's only grief. Thank you very much about talking about your mother, Dorothy. Well, thank you. It's been a very great honour for me and very enjoyable to talk to you.